It's July 8th, 2021. This is Rook. He is a legendary Iranian-American photographer and the man behind a number of iconic photos and images that you most likely have seen and know well. Firuz Zahedi is best known for his long-standing friendship and professional relationship with Elizabeth Taylor as her personal photographer, but also as a young Iranian artist, he was selected by Andy Warhol to be his right-hand man. And Firuz has become the go-to coveted photographer for everyone from Barbara Streisand to Oprah Winfrey to Meryl Streep. Firuz Zahedi joins me for a feature interview from Los Angeles today. This is Stories From, To and About the Iranian Diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 125 of Rook. How are you? (laughs) I don't know what that that? that was. And you make fun of me for doing that. I had an image of myself saying how I, not sounding like so, you know. Like a uh, hick Well, I thought my deep voice, hello, how are you? I thought I'd do something more fun, but then... Howdy! How are you? I don't know what happened. It just didn't work. Oh, like from Queens, an old lady <laughs> from Queens, New York. How are you? How are you? Uh, welcome and how are you? I don't know why. It just, I, I, I'll just stick to my own voice for now. Firu Zahidi has left the conversation. <laughs> Firu Zahidi has already given up on the interview. <laughs> welcome to those of you listening around the world in Toronto, in Toulouse, in Tehran, in Turin, in Tokyo, Hope you're all doing okay. Hope you are Mizun and you're ready for another edition of Rook. How are you? Hello. Hello. Shaja Khubi. Hello. Hello. Did you guys smoke something earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Castbox, and Telegram are the podcast platforms. If you'd like to see some visuals and see us on social media, switch over to YouTube or Instagram. Uh, and if you like the Rook descriptions and bulletins in English, as well as Persian. Uh, check us out on Telegram. All the handles are Rook Media. Hello, the fabulous Keon. Hi. How yeah. are you? <laughs> How are you? It's turning into an Australian. Oh, please How stop. Are you? <laughs> You're giving me a headache. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I have no uh, idea. Hi, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Uh, hi, Shaya. Hi, is, uh, are, uh, hmm? How are you? Hello. How are you? <laughs> uh, How are you? <laughs> Why do we Iranians, when they say hello, they kind of yell at it a little bit? Yeah. Hello! Yeah. They, there's I no soft version of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's because of the old f- uh, version of mm. phones that yeah. were, yeah, like. Let's hello. try it right now. Let's say I'm calling you. Okay. 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 Um, and you, no, you're calling me. Okay. And I go, <laughs> hello? Hello! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you for <laughs> acting that out, Shai. I was actually trying to do a realistic. Okay, I'm calling you. You pick up. Hello. Oh, <laughs> it's a failure. What's happening here? <laughs> Children, please oh settle God. down. Is, there's oh nothing, God. nothing worse than what oh. we just did. Uh, yeah, I don't so know. Maybe cut that. Show later. 125. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Fidu Zahidi. You know, I was thinking about what we what we aim to do with this show. Mm. And, and it's often, you know, talking about issues, ideas, idiosyncrasies in the lives of people of Iranian descent, Persian descent around the world. Um, it's hearing the stories of well-known Iranians. And in some cases, like on Monday's program, it's about introducing mm. uh, new or young talents within our diaspora somewhere in the world, like the uh, guitarist we had on uh, Monali Jamal on Monday. But then 
Sometimes it's also about spreading the word on legendary members of our community who have not always gotten their due or are not known by newer generations. And I was thinking Firuz Zahedi really fits into this category. Like, if you don't recognize his name, you really, uh, I'm hoping this goes well with him, but I'm, I'm hoping people tune in for this interview because he is, uh, listen, forget his works with Elizabeth Taylor and Barbara Streisand, a number of her album covers, um, all his work for Vanity Fair. He does cover so many magazines. His years with the counterculture king, Andy Warhol. Just the Pulp Fiction poster alone, like for a Gen Xer, you know, for me, that poster, if you know the movie Pulp Fiction or the soundtrack, that photo with Uma Thurman uh, lying on the bed. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it, it is an image that some of us have, it's almost like we've always known it. We mm-hmm. And we will know forever. And it was created by this guy. He did the art direction. He took the photo. He came up with the idea. Tarantino sort of let him do it. Uh, it's amazing, right? Who would have known? And it, it was completely his idea, if I'm not mistaken, it's right? Like the entire, yeah, 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 like yeah. the setup of the photograph. Yeah. That's iconic. That's an iconic yeah. photograph that, yeah. you know, and he's behind this. Well, it's an image that, it's a pop culture image that right. transcends uh, uh, generations and borders mm-hmm. and, and uh, cultures. And you just know that Pulp Fiction yeah. poster. I mean, I'm sure there's people who don't know it, but for us, you know, we certainly know it. And it's all Fidu Zahidi. That's so, um, I, actually, I was just thinking, I just got a bulletin about um, if you live in Toronto, if you live in Ontario, we have the Art Gallery of Ontario. Mm-hmm. And it's opening up, um, it's reopening for the first time in, right. uh, in a few weeks. Mm-hmm. And its first exhibit is an Andy Warhol exhibit. That's right. You know, yeah. and, I, and I was thinking, I mean, Andy Warhol is such a, remains this huge character in 20th century pop art mm-hmm. and uh and Fidu Zahidi was you know hand selected by Andy Warhol yeah. to hang out with him and be his guy you know Incredible. when Feeders is in his 20s so I want to get to all of that yeah. on the on the show but very 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 happy to have him coming on the program and hoping that a lot of people uh, already know him but those who don't will um, learn about somebody in our in our global community that we should really be enamored of I believe mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. All right. Thank you, Captain Rado. <laughs> <laughs> he's, Hello. He's, he's, playing a, home? he's playing some NBA <laughs> Nintendo game or something. <laughs> 110%. I did get that. I spoke for 10 minutes about this guy. And that's why we should be a never. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, myterms.ca. A shout out to Arash and Anita Fazelipur. You know, I love these two. They are life partners and business partners as the founders of MyTerms.ca. That's the website, MyTerms.ca. This is a mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They were both born in Iran, grew up in Canada and the United States. They decided to go into business and life together uh, about 20 years ago. And they they really have a good record with MyTerms.ca, focusing on the service aspect of the mortgage business. They're very well reviewed online and they make it a big priority to give back to the Persian community. Community as well, Arash and Anita Fazilipur and MyTerms.ca. Hey, in the football world, you guys will know why I've been happy for the last yeah. 24 yes, hours. Yes, Leon, everybody knows Come why. On, you're so- then, uh, Come on, then, England! Come on! Yeah. Uh, I'm not clapping. Uh, it is. <laughs> 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 have you switched over to Italy now? No, Should no, I, no, we want? no Surache oh, means Surache, they, they, they have, have a, hole a big in hole in yeah. their goal. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you say? Yeah. Italy, yeah. Surache. Wow, what a strange thing to yeah, say. Yeah, that is very odd. These Persians are crazy. A little filthy too, <laughs> no? <laughs> that's, that's why they didn't, they didn't let women into the stadium because there's a lot of like profanity and swear oh, words. It all oh makes sense God. now. I oh, I so I wasn't even thinking about that. I thought it meant like there's a <laughs> hole in the we, we can score a goal because they're yes. Oh, but I, 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 but it's also a euphemism. Sorry, I thought something. <laughs> I turned it dirty. <laughs> it was my fault. Okay, yeah, all right. With your filthy mind. I'm always. too. I'm too young for what Keon <laughs> thinks. <laughs> I mean, when you use it, so I anyway, England it. and Italy now are the big. Uh, the big game is set up for Sunday. I don't uh, know who I hate more. <laughs> no. Will England you please stop? My the, listen. <laughs> do you hate me? 
I grew up in yeah, England. It depends on the uh, day. You do, actually. It's the wrong question. <laughs> yeah, <I'm kidding. laughs> Listen, it's not about hating. We love no. Italy. We love Italians. Yeah. But, you know, come on now. Since 1966, never in my lifetime has England won okay. anything. Wow. So I would love to yeah. have England win something. And how would and you celebrate if they were to win? Like what, uh, what? Bangers and mash. Shave your hair? Bangers or What are you going to do? Yeah, uh, I will, um, I will, well, I'll, I'll down a pint and... Uh, Swear allegiance to the queen. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do. I'll be. I'll be very happy. It's been a while, and I'll have something to say to all those Iranians who've been yelling at me for supporting England. <laughs> you know, the the country that I have dual citizenship with. For God's sake. Hey, we'd like you to join our Rook community. If you like what we do on this show, check out our website, rookmedia.com, and become a patron. Uh, we really depend on you guys, and it can be any amount at all, uh, rookmedia.com. Uh, big thanks to those of you who have become patrons, even for 5 or $10 a month. It makes a big difference to us. If you're a regular listener, I don't know if you have a lot of excuses anymore. You know, uh, you're a regular listener, 5 or $10 a month. This will go... Uh, a long way in this exploration of the connective tissue of Iranian diaspora identity and to do it with as few commercials and ads as possible. All right, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, stick around. Let's get to our feature guest. My feature guest today is a prominent Iranian American photographer behind a number of photos and images that you have likely seen and know well. Firuz Zahedi was born in Tehran. His family moved to England where he received his secondary education. And in 1969, at the age of 20, he moved to the U.S. where he would eventually study art after a stint as a diplomat. While still in art school, he began taking photos photos for Andy Warhol's interview magazine and served as its Washington, D.C. correspondent. In 1976, Firuz met and became friends with Elizabeth Taylor. And soon after that, they traveled together to Iran. The photographs from that trip, which included the actress dressed in local tribal costumes, alongside portraits he took of her on the set of A Little Night Music in Vienna, became the subject of a cover story for Interview Magazine. Then in 1978, Firuz accompanied Elizabeth Taylor to Hollywood as her personal photographer and worked on the set of the film Return Engagement. Firuz then made Los Angeles his home for the most part, built his career as a portrait photographer, working for major magazines including Vanity Fair, Time, Vogue, GQ, and he shot covers for a number of Barbara Streisand albums and has been the coveted photographer of such superstars as Angelina Jolie, Jennifer Lopez, Leo DiCaprio, Meryl Streep, John Travolta, Oprah. Winfrey and Ellen DeGeneres. Furious's advertising work includes the legendary image for the movie poster for Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction. His photography and collages have been shown internationally at galleries and exhibitions around the world. And his latest book of never seen before photographs of Hollywood's biggest stars, Look at Me, made a big splash when it was released last year. He lives in Los Angeles and New York. Currently, he's working on a book on great homes in Montecito, but right now, Firuz Zahidi joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello, sir. Hello there. How are you? I'm very well. It's a great pleasure to speak to you. I'm familiar with your work. I'm a fan. I thank you for doing this. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. You, you know, there was a, uh, you'll probably remember, there was a memorable Woody Allen movie in the 1980s uh, named Zelig, where the lead character finds himself in the middle of all kinds of historical events and with, with the most prominent societal figures. And it, it, it occurs to me that you've had a Zelig type life when it comes to popular Western culture, whether it's Andy Warhol or Liz Taylor or Pulp Fiction. Were you always a people person when you were growing up in Iran? Um. You know, I was very shy when I was a kid in growing up in Iran, in a very conservative environment, you know, back in the 50s. And, um, you know, back then, a kid was a kid. You couldn't do much. You couldn't say much. You had to do what you were told. And when you grew up, you had to do what they told you to do. So I grew up in that kind of an environment. And I had to suppress a lot of feelings and fantasies of what I wanted to do, what, you know, where I wanted to go with my life. I was always very creative. Even, you know, as a little kid, I could draw well at school and on my own. I landed up going to a boarding school in England, which I despised. It was an awful experience, seven years of like, you know, imprisonment, basically. <laughs> and then I kind of fled to America just to get away from that suppression and 
I mean, I, the, the compromise was I went to Georgetown University to study foreign service. And I worked as a diplomat. I earned money. And, you know, I became a people person at that point because I had to as a diplomat. I mean, my family's background was diplomacy, you know, government and all that sort of stuff. But I wasn't happy because I was not in a milieu I wanted to be in. And one day I said, you know what, enough of this. I'm going to go. I went and signed up at the Corcoran School of Art. And that was like the beginning of my life because it's suddenly like as if doors had opened and sunshine was coming in. And I was so happy because I could express myself. I could be creative. And that changed my personality, my character. And um, I, I became much more comfortable with myself. And I didn't feel like I had to do things for other people. I could do things for myself. But the experience of having been a diplomat was helpful in reality because when I landed up in LA and I had to photograph these prominent people, I knew how to deal with them in a nice way, you know, in a diplomatic way. Right, right. So that was very helpful. And you had the pedigree by that point. Yeah, I mean, and everyone was always saying, oh, you're so nice, you're so polite, da 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 da. <laughs> well, you know, I was naturally a nice guy. I'm going to put it that way. It wasn't but, like. But it's got to be more than that because, uh, forgive me, but I mean, uh, and I want to ask you about being a diplomat because that kind of shocked me. I mean, I knew you as this legendary photographer, and then I find out that in your 20s, you're a, you're a diplomat in D.C., which is a, a very interesting development. But, you know, it wasn't just that you're a nice guy. I mean, the story goes that when you're in art school, when you make that fateful decision you just talked about or, or that, uh, that that great decision, as it turns out, to, to pursue art in the 70s, uh, Andy Warhol takes a shine to you and brings you on. I mean, somebody like Andy Warhol doesn't just gravitate towards anyone. Famously, all these people wanted to be around Andy Warhol, including idols of mine like Bowie. So what what did someone like Andy Warhol see in you? Well, I owe it a lot to a cousin of mine. I mean, we're distant cousins, but she was like a sister to me. Uh, her name is Nima Fairmont Farmayan, whose mother was the late Monir Fairmont Farmayan. And her dad was Manu Cher Yektai, who was a prominent artist living in New York. Um, she was in a milieu of the arts, you know, the artists in New York. And um, she introduced me to Andy. This was at a point when my cousin was ambassador in Washington. And Andy was a, sort of like a celebrity whore. You know, he wanted to get to know everybody who was famous and be friends with them. And my cousin had a big reputation as like the person to know in DC because he gave great parties and, you know, everyone wanted to be included in his parties. And Andy had done like this poster art with Jimmy Carter to help promote him and, you know, for his campaign. And uh, and Andy knew all the people involved with um, the Carter administration. So this is where my diplomatic side kicked in. And I said, look, if we do a party for Andy, we can invite all the people from the White House and, you know, invite all the Democrats, you know, and that would be a good thing. So my cousin said, OK, let's do it. So we did this party for Andy and we got every major name to come. Um, I mean, we had Ted Kennedy. We had all the, half the people from the White House, not Jimmy Carter, but, you know, a lot of prominent people and senators, Congress people, blah, blah, blah. So it was a huge success. It was a huge success for both Andy and my cousin. I got a lot of press. And at that point, Andy said to me, you know what, I'm going to make you Washington, D.C. correspondent for my magazine, and you can take photos, too. And that was really exciting. So wow. I got to do photos, but there was really nobody in Washington <laughs> worth photographing, you know. Uh, I think the well, Kremlin... politicians. Uh, well, I photographed like S Sally Quinn, who was like a prominent uh, journalist who was married to Ben Bradley, you know, right. who ran the Washington Post. I photographed the wife of a Republican congressman. I photographed a bunch of society people, but it wasn't like photographing movie stars or anything. But but hang on a second. Let me. I, you're saying so many things that that are so rich that I can't let them just slip through. Uh, first of all, I, I have seen pictures of you with Liz Taylor in circa mid seventies, uh, but clearly you were not just good looking; you were very good looking because <laughs> <laughs> with all these people drawn to you like flies. But just to put this into context, I mean, you're a 
you're an Iranian kid. You grew up in Iran in the mid 70s. You're in your 20s. What did you make of Andy Warhol? I mean, for people like me, you know, uh, I'm a little young to really have been around in that era and to know. I mean, he's a mythical character, right? He's this 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 magical character that was uh, the the beacon of counterculture and then invented new forms of advertising. But what did you, as this Iranian kid who you describe as shy, make of Andy Warhol and his interest in you? You know, this is the 60s when he did all his major paintings of Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, Jackie Kennedy, Elvis Presley. Every major piece of art he'd done was in the 60s Mm. um, to maybe early 70s. He liked making money. When I met him, he liked making money. So he was promoting himself. He had an entourage of people who would hustle portrait sessions for him. Um, for 25 grand, he would do your portrait. You could be anybody, you know, but you could come up with 25 grand, which back then in the 70s was, you know, big sum of money. Um, he would go to all the parties and schmooze people and his entourage would schmooze people and they would get people interested in having Andy do their portrait. But at the same time, he was still doing his very avant-garde kind of art, you know, like really like the naked guy stuff and uh, uh, I don't know, a whole bunch of stuff that later on, you know, became very, very prominent. But he was also very anxious to make money because he had the factory to run. He had a group of people he had to support. Now, in retrospect, Andy is like huge, much more huge than he was then. At that point, in fact, he didn't have that great a reputation because he was whoring out. You know, Um, but now, I mean, his work goes for millions and millions of dollars. And in retrospect, you look at his history and what he contributed to art history and the culture. It's amazing. I mean, but 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 fear is you weren't intimidated playing in those circles, huh? Even as a somebody in their twenties. No, he gave me room to express myself. He was a nice guy with. He was always very nice with me. In fact, you know, for my birthday one year, he gave me um, a Mick Jagger, you know, one of those Mick Jagger uh, silk screens, w- which are limited editions. Wow. You know, like yeah. he made 200 of each, I think, and some artist proofs. Oh, actually, no. He gave me the Mick Jagger because I got the whole thing going with the embassy. Then he gave me a Marilyn Monroe silk screen. <laughs> so he never paid anybody anything. He was cheap. I mean, we, we did work for him for nothing. I didn't know how to wow. hustle for money. Um I was just excited having been a diplomat in a very restricted environment, suddenly being in this other environment that was creative and I was I had freedom of expression. I was with these artsy types of people who were right. outrageous. You know, it was it was amazing. I mean Now how to, did your prominent diplomatic Persian family feel about you uh, leaving diplomacy and heading to art school and hanging out with Andy Warhol? <laughs> You know, bless my family. My parents, I adore them. You know, they were, they didn't understand what the hell I was doing, but they were always supportive. You know, they thought it was a phase and that I'll wake up one day and say, yeah, I'm going to go back to Iran and get a regular job. That was their, um, their wish, you know. And in fact, I continued, you know, when I, then I met Elizabeth through my cousin. I was trying to get work. There wasn't enough work. And... So I decided, you know, I'm not making any money, you know, I can't be a burden to my family anymore. So I told my parents, okay, I'll go back to Iran. This was in 78 when things were still, you know, in Iran, people were making money and, you know, there was an art scene there too. You know, you could go back to Iran and be an artist at that point. So I went and told Elizabeth, you know, I got to give this up. I can't, you know, I can't support myself here anymore. And, um... I'm going to go back to Iran. And she knew my whole history. She knew I didn't want to go back because I wanted to make it as an artist in in America or in the Western world. You know, th- th- there was that whole thing. I mean, you have a lot of great artists now from Iran that who are showing at major museums all over the world. Mm-hmm. But at that point, the art scene in Iran was not that prominent. You know, right. even the modern art museum that Faradiba did um, was primarily... You know, the Koonings and Picassos right, and right. Doctors who, they were all Western artists. So, 
you know, you didn't look to Iran as a place where you would become a famous artist internationally, you know. So my aim was to become internationally known. I, you know, I was ambitious in that way, but I guess it was a fantasy, but I thought, you know, ever since I was a kid, I had these fantasies of being famous. I no longer have such... Well, let, let, me, let, me, let me unpack that, because and I want to get to Elizabeth Taylor in, in a bit more detail, because again, these stories are just are remarkable to hear in retrospect. First of all, I, I, I should apologize. I didn't mean, I don't want to undersell you by just saying you were hot, uh, <laughs> you were good looking. I mean, because you, because you obviously, you clearly, I mean, it's clear to see now through the, the resume of your work, how um, the talent you have uh as a photographer you that you had this gift but it's interesting to me in researching you that you've said that you did not actually have a lot of technical training when you started becoming a prominent photographer but you said you had and you have an eye you can see something and make it look good can you in very simple terms briefly explain how you do that or at least what it means to have an eye okay that would go back to when i was a little kid in iran and uh, my brother and I would go to the movies. We'd have like the guy who looked after us at the house, you know, like the staff who were looking after us. They'd take us to see a movie and it would be a Hollywood movie and everyone was beautiful. Everyone looked happy. It was Technicolor and beautiful costumes, beautiful cars and houses, blah, blah, blah. And here I am, 1950s Iran, Tehran, and which is the capital is still you had dirt roads here and you were lucky to have a refrigerator even if you're wealthy you know i mean we were living in very humble times in iran in the 50s um and so you would see these movies with these fabulous houses and gorgeous women with beautiful clothes and the guys dressed up and looking handsome and I wanted, I wanted to be a part of that. I had that fantasy. And, you know, I, you had that um, coup in Iran back in the early 50s. And my, honestly, obviously, you know, my family was a part of the previous government. And, you know, my dad was imprisoned by the nationalist um, government. And as a political prisoner, I visited him in jail when I was like three, four years old. And it was like a, it left an effect on me. And it frightened me. And it sort of, made me want to find a safe place in my head. And that safe place was the Hollywood movies, you know? Huh. Everyone beautiful, everyone happy. And so that stayed with me throughout my life. Well, I was always good at drawing. Photography came much later on. But when I took a photo, I wanted, to, I wanted whoever I photographed to look good. I wasn't a photojournalist. I wanted to do portraits and I wanted them to look good. To me, I always feel like art has to have some sort of a beautiful thing about it to pull you in, you know. I go to these galleries, to these museums, and I have these curators who are there explaining a piece of art that's hanging there. And they have to spend a half an hour telling me why the artist did it and what it's about. Right. And I'm still at the end looking, uh, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to walk in and look at a piece of art and go, wow, right. immediately. I need that immediate reaction, you know? I remember when I did my Elizabeth exhibition, you know, I did an exhibition of my Elizabeth photos at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Yes. And it was the most successful exhibition yeah. that it had. Because Elizabeth died. Fe fears, let me get to that. Let me get to that. You're, you're way ahead of me. I, there's so much I want to ask you about. First of all, uh, you mentioned fame a few minutes ago, and, and, you know, you become famous. I mean, now you're known as this legendary photographer, but you become famous through the proximity you have with folks like Andy Warhol and Elizabeth Taylor. And But you've said that you knew early on, this is something of a Warholian thing to say, I should think, that to be a very successful artist, you would need to be famous. Uh, it strikes me as an interesting thing to say. It's quite prophetic. I mean, many artists would would claim they eschew fame or they, 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 they don't want to be known. They want to speak through their art. They just want to make a living. 
why did you believe or know that fame had to be part of the equation way before you you were even in these circles? Where did you dig that up from? I don't recall saying that. You don't recall saying that? <laughs> no, I don't really. You say it was in a um, it was in a talk you did an interview you did with a, a gentleman. I guess it was at a museum or something. Oh, but okay. you said you knew that it was important to be famous yeah. somehow okay. as an artist. But I got to tell you that I did an exhibition. A few years ago, you know, I thought about the whole concept of fame and how you crave to be famous. Not everybody, but a bunch of people in this world want to be famous. They want to be known. They want people to be aware of them, whether it's this need uh, to be recognized or this just neediness to be known, you know, insecurity. Yeah. And um uh, so they do things to become famous, whether as an artist or as a politician or whatever, you know, musician, whatever. Um, so I took that concept because I went through this whole, this, this journey of fame, becoming famous. Um, I never thought I would become famous, by the way. I got to let you know that. I got to a point in my life when I got divorced from my first wife, I was struggling as a photographer. I was doing catalogs, fashion catalogs, whatever came my way for a few hundred bucks I would do. Um, but I had my son, I had a roof over my head. This is back in the early 1983, 84, mm -hmm. 85, something like that. I looked at him, I looked at the fact I had a roof over my head, I looked at the fact I had food on the table, I looked at the fact I was being creative, doing stuff that maybe not everybody was going to see, but I was doing my own personal creative stuff. And I said, you know what, this is it, this is perfection, what else do I want? The irony is, soon after that, the photo editor at Vanity Fair saw one of my photographs in, in Interview Magazine, they gave me an assignment. Then they gave me another assignment. Then another, another, another. Then they put me on the contract. Suddenly, I am famous, okay? And it was ironic because I really had settled for this philosophy of like, you don't need to be famous. Now, once you're famous and you're thrown in, you know, it's like a river flowing fast. You're thrown into it. You got to go with it. And it's, you know, you got to struggle to stay in it. You, you can't pull aside, and if you do, you know. Like, but it's but it's good for business, right? I mean, is, if you're a famous photographer, is not that how you attract all of these famous names who want you to take their it's photo? It's not just the business side. No, it's not a business. It's like once fame comes your way, there's a demand for you, okay? Oh, you did Elizabeth Taylor. We want you to do J-Lo, or right. we want you to do Angelina Jolie. You're, you're, you're good. You're good. So that. People who before had ignored me, suddenly like anything I did or say, oh, you're so great. You know, it was the BS side of it that amused me, but I went along with it because you know what? Now I could afford to get a bigger house. My son could go to a great school. Um, I could put money aside for a great college for him, you know? So all these things were happening and I wasn't gonna say no to it, right. you know? They were blowing smoke up my rear end, but I said, okay, fine, I'll go along with it, you know? Um, so anyway, I went along with it, and then I got exhausted dealing with it at some point. It's just my machinery started slowing down. It just wasn't doing it for me. And I started looking to do exhibitions, fine art work, and I did. So I did this series of photographs. I took slides that I had shot back in the 80s and 90s, and I poured water on them, and I poured chemicals on them. Mm -hmm. I put them aside. From time to time, I went and looked at them. And after a while, the colors would dissolve, and they became beautiful. I don't know if you saw it on my website. Of course, yeah. Um, they became amazing. They looked amazing. And what remained of the face or part of the face or part of the body of whoever was in that image, I kept it at that point. I got it scanned. And I turned them into prints. And the whole concept behind the show was that fame is fleeting. You know, it doesn't last forever. These were people I photographed in the 80s. I said, where are these people now? Right. I don't remember. I don't even remember the name of some of them, <laughs> you know. But the film is still there. The film is proof that film will survive. 
and history will go on but that fame will be gone you know i mean certain people their fame has remained elizabeth taylor john f kennedy uh jackie kennedy but take the average person who was famous who remembers them I don't remember who won the Academy Awards last year. Right, you know? right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a happy guy, but I'm not seeking fame anymore. I'm doing this with you. Obviously, people are going to listen to it. I'm doing it because you're Iranian. I, I, I'd love to, you know, have Iranians know what's going on in yeah. my head. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I do Instagram, and I have a huge Iranian following. And it really is touching for me because they write these things in Farsi in comments, like "You are our hero," or "You are, you're, you're an inspiration," and it just really touches me. You know, it's and I feel sorry for them because you know they're stuck in that part of the yeah. world, in that with that government, and you know they don't have the freedom that I do have. I'm glad you brought that up because I want to actually ask you about your Iranianness. But again, three steps back because Elizabeth Taylor's name has come up a few times already. Uh, I, I want to uh, ask you about her a little bit because it, it is it is your. Um, uh, friendship it is your connection with elizabeth taylor that as you've described earlier that really changes your life and uh it's quite profound it seems uh, if you can take us back to that first meeting you mentioned that your your cousin the ambassador had introduced you guys i mean i'm thinking 1976 you're 27 years old she's a she's a movie she's the biggest movie star in the world how do you get to know elizabeth taylor you know i was intimidated quite frankly because she was the biggest movie star and he invited her to stay at the embassy he did a brunch for her and he asked me to help put the brunch together because you know he was single and i was you know i had worked with him before but after that i would hang out with him you know help him with social occasions like that sorry this uh, is the embassy the iranian embassy in dc yeah, yeah. Why would she come and stay there? Because they were having a relationship. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> well, they were about to embark on a relationship. Okay, okay. okay. Um, you know, I was there. I was supervising, like making sure lunch was going to be ready and the drinks were this, that, that, that. So there was a group of maybe 10, 12 people who were invited, including John Warner, whom she later married. And... Um, so she arrived with her hairdresser slash assistant and she was very sweet and very down to earth and came over and shook everyone's hands and introduced herself rather than you know people having to go bow down to her um and i was very shy and you know i mean here's a movie star and i've grown up watching her movies and i mustered up a few things to say to her but not that much and then I thought, okay, that's the end of that. Then a few days later, he called me up and said he's got to go to New York for some UN type meeting or something. And could I look after her? Because she was playing at the embassy. <laughs> oh, that's so great. So I thought, oh my God, you know, I've got to look after Elizabeth Taylor. So I go over, we get, the car is there, and she comes, and I'm like super shy. She comes in the car, and I was going to sit in the front with the driver. And she said, no, come sit in the back with us, with her and the hairdresser. It was a limo. So I'm sitting next to Elizabeth Taylor. Sorry, sorry. What, I, what, what does it mean to look after Elizabeth Taylor? <laughs> this is, do you mean that you, you're going to take her around town, or what, what are you expected to do? Take her around town. Okay. Uh, you know, make sure she gets lunch and dinner or whatever, you right. know? Okay. Uh, so I took her for a tour of D.C., and... Uh, you know, we went to the Washington Monument, to the Lincoln Memorial, to this, to that. Then we stopped at the National Gallery. It's a huge, you know, museum gallery. And we were wandering around. And I was at art school still at that point. It was my final week with exams and stuff like that. I skipped school that day. But hey, you know, are you going to look after Elizabeth Terrell? Go to stupid school, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm going to look after Elizabeth Terrell. And so this photographer was in the museum and took a photo of her and I. The next day, it was in the Washington Post. So when I went back to school the next day, and I said, oh, you know, I was sick. I couldn't come. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, really? You know, they put the newspaper in front of me. So I was in trouble. But I took her around, and then um, we had lunch. And then 
I stayed for dinner with her, you know. So at dinner, we finally, it was just her and I at the table, this grand table with like butlers serving food, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, what can I talk about with her? You know, here I am alone. You know, the assistant wasn't there. It was just me right. and her. Um, I said, what the hell am I going to talk about? You know, it's Elizabeth Taylor. You know, like, who am I to be sitting at a dinner table with Elizabeth Taylor? Were you, forgive me, but were you, were you attracted to her? Were you, was no, that, were you? I mean, you know, she was 44. I was 26, 27, something like that. I had girlfriend at the at point, my age. Um, but she's so, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, but I mean, you know. She was a superstar. I never, <laughs> I didn't belong to that class. Right, too. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I didn't have, I didn't have that ticket to go into that room, basically. Um, so anyway, I said, what am I going to talk about with her? I said, oh, you know, I love movies and, you know, I'd love to make movies one day. And she said, oh, you don't want to do that. So we started talking about movies and I realized she was bored and fed up making movies and I thought, okay, I'll put aside that um, conversation. We went on, she said, tell me about yourself. So I said, you know, I want to be an artist and I'm going to art school now, but I was a diplomat. So, it, you know, I just poured my heart out finally. I was like talking to a therapist, basically. And she said, you know, you should pursue what you want to do in life. Don't waste your time. Don't do things people want you to do. And it became, she became like my mentor, my the person who would give me the best advice to and throughout the, not just that night but all the time she would give me encourage me don't give up and that's when you know in 78 when i was about to give up she said don't give up i'm going to la to do a movie i'll take you along as my photographer and that was when my life changed and i came yeah. to la yeah and then she went you know after the movie she went back east but I fell in love with my, the person I married at that point, and I stayed. And it was a struggle for several years, but then I made it. Um, if she was kind of a mentor for you, what do you, I mean, she was obviously, um, there was a quid pro quo. She was really getting something out of this relationship that would last years, uh, your friendship. Uh, what, what do you think Elizabeth Taylor was getting from you? She was getting a genuine friendship, not like a, you know, someone who wanted to, not like a parasite, a hanger on her, or nothing like that. Right, it was right. genuine. She would open up her heart to me. I would open up my heart to her. It wasn't, I didn't want anything from her. She knew that. Right. And I kept her company at a point in her life when, you know, she and my cousin broke up that summer after the summer was over. And then she landed up moving to Washington, marrying John Warner. It wasn't the happiest period of her life. She wasn't happy in Washington, but she needed to have a man in her life. And John was a nice guy, but he was a Republican senator and she was a Democrat and she wasn't happy. And so she would drink, she would stay home and I would go and hang out with her and she would tell me about her life. You know, the way she acted like my therapist, I acted like her therapist, uh -huh. you know? And that bonded us those two years in DC. That's why she pulled me on to L.A. You know, that, that would just happen. I had no idea she was going to do that. You know, I had rented out my apartment. I owned an apartment in D.C. I'd rented it out. I was ready to move back to Iran. And she said, don't go. I said, yeah, but I don't have a home anymore. She said, come and stay at our house. I mean, that's the kind of woman she was. She had a big heart because she did so much for me in my life. I owed her. That was at least you know, what I could do for her. Fear is that trip that um, that you guys take to Iran, you and Elizabeth Taylor. It's one of those things that I mean, our audience is predominantly Iranians. There's non-Iranians listening as well, but predominantly people of Iranian descent around the world are listening to us right now. And just mentioning your name, you know, people. Um, uh, there's a there's a few things that happen in Iran in the 70s uh, as as Tehran is becoming this really cosmopolitan place and. You know, one of them is uh, Farrah Fawcett and Lee Majors visit Iran. You know, uh, another one is Elizabeth Taylor visits. I mean, people just know about this trip, you know, and I don't know if they know it in retrospect because of you and the exhibition and the book and all of that stuff or, or if they knew it at the time. But tell me a bit about that trip. I mean, what, what do you most remember about it? And when you're in Tehran with Elizabeth Taylor, 
I'm imagining that people recognize her, or do they, when she's going and buying things in the bazaar and coming back and showing you them in the hotel? I mean, uh, what what was the whole vibe of this trip like for you? Um, you know, there were places we would go to that no one had any idea who she was. Because this was, you know, she was in her mid-40s. She wasn't looking like the movie star Elizabeth Taylor from 20s and 30s. And, you know, she would dress in casual T-shirts and jeans and, you know, her hair wasn't done properly. And few people might recognize her, not a lot. Because, you know, when you're going in Shiraz and Isfahan and in areas like marketplaces, those people were not familiar with uh, movie stars, quite honestly. I mean, like, in Tehran, there was m a little bit more of it. We had a car and driver. We would go to a location, we'd get off and go to the bazaar or whatever. People would look at her because she was a foreigner, but I don't think they always recognized her. Hmm. And then when we were in Shiraz and we went to that mosque, I told her, you got to wear a chador. And she did. And, you know, all you could see were her eyes. I mean, in retrospect, when you'd see my photograph of her, you know, the eyes pop. Amazing, you know? amazing. You know, yeah. with a chador, no one knew who she was. We were kind of guarded in a way because we had a lady who was looking after us. And we had a car and a driver, so we'd go to a destination, get off, run around, get back in the car and go back to the hotel. And then in the evenings, there were like events, like at somebody's palace or somebody's residence or whatever. We went to a few of those and then she was really not into it. She just wanted to go incognito, and uh, which was great fun. And for me, it was great because I hadn't been to some of these places and I'm so glad I did it. Because I never went back to Iran after that. And if I hadn't done that, I would never have seen Persepolis and, mm. you know, been to the shrine of Ferdowsi, Sadi, all these people. And, you know, it, you know it, it, it occurs to me that, uh, as I think about it now, this is a time before social media, obviously. This is, this is a time when somebody even as big internationally, a, a superstar like Elizabeth Taylor, could visit a place like Iran and perhaps go to places where she wouldn't be recognized. What do you think she made of Iran? What did she tell you about her feelings about Iran? She had fun. I mean, it was a culture. It was a different culture for her to see. And she was savvy enough to appreciate the culture and respect it for what it was and to respect it in the way that she knew she had to wear a chador to go to the mosque. And she was very respectful about that. She took on the Jewish faith. I mean, she had faith, you know, she had mm. faith and she respected faith. Um, Do you take Elizabeth Taylor uh, to your parents' house in Iran for Qayme? I mean, well, my parents <laughs> lived in London, but the funny thing oh. is on the way back, the flight stopped in London for a few days. She went and stayed with a friend of hers in Chelsea, Norma Heyman, who is a good friend of hers. I went and stayed with my parents in London and then she and Norma were going to go to the ho dog races of all things. And she said, do you want to bring your parents? And here I am saying to my parents, do you want to go to the dog races with me and Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> and already, like, they were saying to me, you know, you shouldn't be hanging around with Elizabeth Taylor. And, you know, uh, people will talk uh -huh. and this and that. I mean, they were very conservative. <laughs> I don't know, you know, like, <laughs> sweet, you know, they were all old, old school Iranians. Um, so I said, no, come and have dinner with her. So we got to the, took a cab to the dog races, which were like little, and here was Elizabeth in a t-shirt and blue jeans. And, you know, my mom and dad probably had seen her in Cleopatra and all these costume <laughs> movies and, and had this vision of her as a movie star, you know. And there she was dressed down like a hippie, you know. So my mom, a very stylish lady, was like a little, mm, you know, shocked by that. <laughs> but they got on really well. And funny thing is there were a couple of other people who came along as a part of her entourage. And one of them was the brother of this actor, Terrence Stamp. I don't know if you remember Terrence Stamp. Sure, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Major English actor, very good looking. He was like the Brad Pitt of England back in the 60s. And his brother was part of Elizabeth's group. And he said, oh, I'll drive you guys back home. He was drunk as a sailor and he was driving like crazy. And I thought, oh my God, here I am taking my parents back home <laughs> with a drunken 
brother of a movie star, and we're going to have a crash. And that's the end of me and my parents, and they never want to talk to me again. But we got home okay. So that ended well. Fears, let me ask you about, um, if, you, if you don't mind, about your craft, about being a, a photographer, because the, the, the second half of your life, after this intervention from uh, Elizabeth Taylor, this positive intervention of bringing you to uh, Los Angeles, shepherds in this, what you've been doing for the last four decades, this, and becoming this photography legend in the, in the States, where you've pretty much shot everyone of note when it comes to popular culture and big stars. Tell me, what is the trick to photographing a famous person. I mean, how do you approach a shoot with someone like, say, Julia Roberts or Angelina Jolie? These are people that you know uh, have been photographed hundreds, maybe thousands of times in the last 30 years. How do you approach that trying to do something uh, unique or original? Um, To start with, I'm always trying to make them look their best. You know, there's some photographers who take an angle that's not always that nice, but I don't try to direct them too much. I let them be themselves. I'm polite, I'm pleasant. You know, I have a little conversation beforehand, uh, see what their likes and dislikes are, and Mm -hmm. I just let it roll, and they will open up, and as you go along and they build up trust in you and they know you're not going to be you're not there to take advantage of them they will give you their best and at the end of the day you don't want to look at a bad photo of julia roberts or angelina jelly or whoever you want to see a pretty picture of them otherwise why bother you know right um so i make them look good i make them feel comfortable i show them respect and that evolves into a relationship, a working relationship, sometimes a friendship as well. Um, basically, it's the trust issue, you know? It's like, hey, I'm not here to screw you over. I'm here to make you look good. I'm here to respect you. So that's it. I mean, and, and I have an eye for beautiful things. I mean, I, things should be beautiful. Life is too short to get ugly, you know? <laughs> I mean, if, if Julia Roberts was standing in front of your Angelina jo- would you make her look bad? <laughs> ah, well, no. Well, well, give me an example, though. When you talk about that working relationship and the trust, I mean, you you did a number of, you've done a lot of work with Barbara Streisand. You did a number of her album covers. Uh, I had the occasion to interview Barbara Streisand a few years ago yeah. in New York. She's she's lovely, I lo- but, but it was interesting. I mean, she's very aware that she wants to look a certain way. In fact, she was sitting when I came into the room and she she, she said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get up because they've got me perfectly set up from the angle I like. So I know that she's idiosyncratic in terms of what she likes. So how do you, what do you learn about someone like Barbara Streisand that makes her want to keep using you as her photographer? Barbara, the first time I photographed her, Columbia Pictures hired me, sent me to New York said we need you to do some publicity shots with barbara she's got this new movie she's directed so they sent me to new york and before i left their office the the marketing guy said to me first don't let her take over the directing (laughs) of photographs she has a tendency to do that if you give in and you let her start you're finished then she'll take over the rest of the day so i said okay you know at that point i built up enough confidence in dealing with you know major names not to uh, be intimidated so i went to new york the day before the shoot i went to her place um to have a cup of tea with her and just get to know her and discuss the shoot and i ironically she had come to the embassy when she was dating or you know having a relationship with this guy john peters so i had there was a photo of her and I remembered that photo, and I said, oh, you know, I met you a long time ago at Iran in Mercy, my cousin, blah, 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 you know, all that. And so that broke the ice a little bit. So the next day I go with my assistants, we set up the first shot. You know, we shot on film, so you shoot a Polaroid before you shoot the film. So I tested all the lighting, everything looked great. I said, well, you know, the lighting from here, or blah, blah, blah. started making some suggestions, and I said, Barbara, just trust me, Okay. So she stopped saying anything, and I shot, and I shot, and I shot. 
And she got more and more into it, and we shot like 10 setups to the point. I was exhausted. And towards the end of the day, I did the shot of her when the sun was going down, and she looked out of a window, and I went out on this little terrace. This was in her apartment in New York. And I did the shot of her, and she was so relaxed, and she looked over her shoulder at me with this beautiful smile. And that was my favorite shot of the day. Everything else was beautiful, but that was like really special. Right. So I handed in the film, and they paid me handsomely, but I never saw that photo. And I'd suggested to them, you know what, you should really try and use this picture. Didn't see it. So years go by, and I'm in New York, I'm waiting to cross the street, and this taxi comes in front of me, and, you know, they have these like little mini billboards on top of a yep. taxi promoting, and there's my photo of Barbara, the one I like. Back to Broadway, her new album. I said, oh my God, that's my favorite. <laughs> so I go and tell my agent, you know, I saw it. And she said, yeah. And they called and they want you to go to Vegas. She's doing two, three nights of uh, performances. They want you to go there and photograph her for her new album and for the whole thing. So I went and spent three days with her, not just taking photos, but hanging out with her, sitting around with her giving her advice, getting to know her. She's a lovely lady. So anyway, so that's my barber story. Uh, you know, for a certain generation, which would be mine, Gen Xers, as big as it is the Elizabeth Taylor work and the Andy Warhol and all of that, it would be the poster for Pulp Fiction uh, with Uma Thurman that is the most iconic for us. Some of us actually had it on our walls and uh, <laughs> in our bedrooms. Uh, you did that. I mean, can you explain how that came about? Yes, I can, because I'm dealing with a lawsuit with Miramax right now. I can't talk too much about it, but they've been using that image without my consent for years. Oh. Um, so Miramax came to me. This was at a time I was doing major movie posters for a lot of money for the major movie companies like Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, etc., Fox. And Miramax was just this tiny little indie uh, film company. And they came to my agent and said, uh, we'd like for us to do the poster for this film we're doing called Pulp Fiction that Quentin Tarantino is doing. So my agent said, you know, they've approached to do this. They don't have much money. And it's a Quentin Tarantino movie. And at that point, I'd seen Reservoir Dogs, which was his first movie. And I thought, this guy's edgy, edgy filmmaker. You know, I like his work. I said, well, what's the film about? So they send me the script. And they send me a little clip of the movie, like five, ten minutes of it. And I really liked what I saw and I read. And I said, you know, I love old Pulp Fiction paperbacks and movies and stuff like that. In fact, I had a collection of old Pulp Fiction paperbacks. You know, the covers, these are from the 60s, you know. They always had like some woman in an embrace with a guy or having been shot dead by a guy or a guy shot dead by a woman. Right. You know, they were very cool looking illustrations, paintings, whatever. Um, so I had a vision, if I was to do this, it would have to be like a Pulp Fiction paperback cover. And I said to her, if I can control the concept, if I, you know, I have carte blanche to do it, I'll do it for that minimum fee they're offering. No, I don't want any interference. And she talked to them and she talked, called me back and said, yeah, they'd love for you, they think you're the best, and you're da, 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 da. Because when I shot for the major film companies, you'd go to these production meetings that would have 20 people around the table, advertising people, marketing people, agents, managers, blah, blah, blah. and they would show 50 illustrations. We should do it like this. We should do it. They never had one good concept to work with. And they watered everything down to the point that major budget, you know, movies with big budgets always landed up with schlocky ads or posters because right. they wanted the obvious like two faces one of them holding a gun two faces looking this way that nothing was exciting you know so so sorry were you, so were you being hired or were you offering yourself to do just the photo with Uma Thurman or were you doing the whole art direction as well I did the whole thing okay. it was my concept my concept to recreate and I said, you know, I wanted, I had this good set builder. And I told him, I want you to build me a cheap motel room in my studio. 
and a bed and I told him everything I wanted and he saw clearly what I wanted and he was creative enough to give me exactly what I wanted. So I made it sleazy and sort of film noir yeah. old, you know, Hollywood. Um, and the Pulp Fiction book in front of her was from my collection of Pulp Fiction oh, books. Oh, wow. That I spread open. And so the whole concept was mine. And I was thrilled. I shot Quentin Tarantino some months later for a magazine. He walked into my studio, Fruz, you made my movie with that poster. He said, it was the perfect image to enhance my movie, to, to sort of complement my movie. Yeah, to, I mean, it's, to, like a, it's like a hit song. Like if you, when you, I mean, conceive of all that and do that, and then it becomes this, I mean, it, it is, you know, I, I, I'm always careful to throw around the term iconic because it gets used a lot and it, it shouldn't. It should be reserved for certain moments. But that image is iconic. You know, that is burned into our imaginations forever. Uh, and I think he's, he's not wrong, Tarantino, that it helped make the film. How does that feel to you? How did it feel to you in, in the, the months great. after that? You know, I got to be honest with you. It was the first time I had carte blanche to be the creative person that I am. When you're a commercial photographer in Hollywood, editorially, you know, you know what you gotta deliver. For Vanity Fair, I knew what I had to deliver to them. For the movie magazines, I knew what I had to deliver to them. Each magazine had a shtick. You know, you had to deliver. I mean, I was known for doing sexy pictures of women for all the magazine. You know, so I had to stick to that. You know, I could never do Julia Roberts looking like a PhD graduate, you know. <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, but for movie posters with big budgets, which I did a lot of, they they restricted you because they were for the masses. They were for the big audiences. And they didn't want to alienate people by giving them a sophisticated image. Whereas this was a small film company and they could play around. They had the room to do something like that. And to get that, I went on to do several more posters for Miramax. I did the Jackie Brown poster for Tarantino. I did uh, Marvin's Room with Leo DiCaprio. I did House of the Spirits with Meryl Streep, Glenn Close, all these people. But none of them ever matched what I did for Quentin and that movie. That's magical. Because they're too scared to let you have a say, you know? The marketing people don't... Don't let you do that. By the way, it was also a hit soundtrack, as you know. So, And that's the album cover, uh, too. Um, you know, in a modern context, I wanted to ask you, do you think the art of photography has somehow been compromised or lost something in an age of iPhones and Photoshop? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, you know, everybody with an iPhone is a photographer now. I mean, people are doing exhibitions with their iPhone photos. And, and in one way, you know, it's nice to have that contraption and send photos to each other. And another way, I mean, the digital age has totally ruined photography because with film, you really had to be experienced in making people look good when you shot them. You didn't have a lot of opportunities in post-production with retouching right. you know it was limited what you could retouch with digital everyone says oh we'll fix it in post you know it's all in photoshop there is no challenge i don't find it challenging anymore i'm not interested in it anymore you mentioned that exhibit of photos at lakba of, of iran before the revolution and the big success that that exhibit had uh would you like to go and shoot I Iran today? I mean, notwithstanding the political uh, issues that would probably prevent you from doing so? If I could go there without being in prison, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind. But you know what? I would be very sad to go see the Iran of today. You know, let's see. It's been since 76 since I've been there. I mean, the wall-to-wall -wall high scra skyscrapers there now. And... And and it doesn't have that charm anymore that it had when I was there. You know, my wife, she's American and she's Jewish. She was fascinated by my talking about Iran. And so LACMA, the curator that, you know, gave me my show, arranged for a trip to Iran six years ago or so. So my wife went. Oh, wow. And uh, she she had a terrific time. 
but she didn't know the Iranians then, you know. She thought it was great, she loved the people, and she just found them all super nice, loved the country, loved the food, loved the site. She got to see the Modern Art Museum. They went on a private tour. And uh, because, you know, she's a major art collector and she got to see stuff that has been locked up in the basement of that museum. Wow. I don't know if I want to go back. I want to keep it as a sweet memory from my past, you know? So on that note, a, a final a question, which I... I uh, I'm, I am so grateful for the time you've given us, by the way. I've really enjoyed this, and I think the audience, uh, I have no question, has as well. You, you're, you're back to that, the last time you were in Iran, in fact, and, and uh, Elizabeth Taylor, and this, this, um, uh, this, the pretext of the whole interview, we've been talking about her and your, your lifetime friendship with her until she died. If I were to ask you, you said she played a mentoring role, and I know you were there for her as well. If I would ask, what did you most learn? from Elizabeth Taylor, what would you say? Oh, I learned so much from her, but the biggest thing I learned from her was compassion and tolerance. You know, we Iranians grew up with a certain amount of arrogance. I don't know, you know, we thought we were the creme de la creme of the world, you know? So you have this situation that you have that in your system and you go around walking around with it and as I spent my life in the Western world, and I grew up in England, I went to school there and then college in America, and then later life in America, I started unloading that, you know, no, I'm nothing special as an Iranian. I am an Iranian. I love being an Iranian. I'll always be an Iranian at heart. There's wonderful things about Iran, but there is that arrogance about us that is very distasteful, not in all of us, in some of us. I learned to be more humble through her. I learned to be more compassionate. I learned to be tolerant of, towards everyone. You know, we always thought we were above this civilization and that culture and this race and that. You know, we turned our noses up. I don't do that anymore. And a lot of it is thanks to Elizabeth. I, I always treasure her. I mean, you know, she's... Um, what a lucky guy I was to know her and have her in my life. I mean, I was blessed, and that's all I can say. Peter Zahidi, I so much appreciate this. Uh, it's been an education. It's been quite, I'm still reeling from the fact that Andy, Andy Warhol gave you Prince of Marilyn Monroe. I mean, I, uh, you've had quite a lifetime. I look forward to what you're going to do next, and I thank you so much for this today. It's been a pleasure. You're a great guy, and I look forward to watching more of your show. So keep it up. You're Thank doing you. a great job. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Firu Zahedi, a world renowned Iranian American photographer, his latest book of never before seen photographs of Hollywood's biggest stars, Look at Me, was published last year. Firu Zahedi joined us from Los Angeles, California today. Right, microphone's back on for Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. Well, I could have done that for a few more hours. Why didn't you? I wish. You <laughs> How did. about those stories? Hold on to him for another two no, hours. No, he had to go. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't do it for. But but he is a fountain of stories. Wow! What wow. a life. I am in awe of this man. My God. Just you, know, you know what I really like, though? Sorry, before I get your opinion, I, I just want to say I really liked, he's mentioned it a couple of times in the interview just now. He was talking about how I just want people to look good. You, you know, he didn't have sort of an agenda to get some artistic shot or, you know, uh, I, I want to do something that nobody's done. He, he's like, don't you want Julia Roberts to look, don't you want to mm. see a picture of her, the best she can look? I love the candor and the and the openness about, I'm going to take a picture of you and I'm going to make you look as good as you can possibly look. Yeah. And why wouldn't people want that. No wonder they keep going back to That's him. Right. Barbara Streisand keeps wanting to get him to take her photo, yeah. you know? Who knew? Who knew this Iranian man was behind all these literally iconic photographs? You knew, actually. I, I you mean, I, him, I've right? heard of him. I, I brought him up a few yeah. months ago, but I not I didn't know his life. I, you mm -hmm. know, I just knew him after a Google search, basically. And um, 
him his friendship with elizabeth taylor alone my god that was like i'm just in i'm generally in awe of that time period so to hear someone's mm -hmm. first-hand accounts of mm -hmm. you know that time is incredible I, w I we need to bring him back on <laughs> i don't so think it's just questions. anybody could you know there's something about this man yeah. and he had the charm and right. besides his his talents i mean andy warhol elizabeth taylor he's a great photographer but even that's not enough he 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 was i mean can you imagine you know reza hanging out with elizabeth <laughs> taylor I mean, it wouldn't you know she would, she, uh, after definitely half an hour she'd be calling the cops you know <laughs> get this guy away from me i'm scared of him you know whatever yeah uh, yeah <laughs> The <laughs> what would I do? Why would she scare me? <laughs> she wouldn't have much to talk about with, yeah. with, uh, with well, Captain Fiona Reza. Not so much. He was great. Yeah, oh. she loved him. Yeah. But no, hey, I, I really liked you in Cleopatra. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Captain Reza. Yeah, that's all I um, say. Can somebody please take this? <laughs> get this bed away. Kind of beat Elizabeth By Taylor. Way, yeah. like, hey. You're really great. And who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Uh, okay. Um, oh thank you. Can <laughs> Yeah. I love you the giant. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great by the way. You want to grab a cup of coffee? You, okay. don't, you don't have to fake <laughs> your uh, you know the way you talk or just, uh, <laughs> just just do you reuse your regular voice. <laughs> we like love that. you the way you are, man. <laughs> yeah. Just talk the way you are. Uh, like he puts on a voice to pretend to be him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by the way, he uh, he let it slip that his cousin dated Elizabeth Taylor. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, it, it did occur like uh, you know so, so why, wait, why was Elizabeth Taylor at the Iranian <laughs> embassy in DC? <laughs> <laughs> like staying at the embassy that's strange right <laughs> of all things doesn't she have a house you know she's Elizabeth Taylor <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was very sweet the way he said yeah. that too. What did he say? Uh, mm, they were having relations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was so crazy. cool. Oh. No, it was you know for me the but when I was looking him up, I saw the pictures and then, then I looked <laughs> him up again. I saw pictures of Elizabeth Taylor and like at the Hafiz. Yeah, they went to Shiraz, my city. Yeah. Yes. So they could have very well met if I was born at a very different decade. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if she'd be. <laughs> she would have taken a flight home to the U U.S. <laughs> that <laughs> night, right from Shiraz. <laughs> 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 Get me out. Here. <laughs> Gotta get out of this God. country. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We would have been great. You, pals. You're still seeing Richard Burton. Uh, <laughs> could, could you please get this man away from me? <laughs> uh, but, but uh, in all uh, seriousness, the, his sto his stories are uh, incredible. But what mm -hmm. uh, got me super excited was when because Andy Warhol. I, I didn't know much about Andy Warhol aside from that he was an amazing artist and all that. Uh, but when he said what he talked, uh, they spilled the beans on Andy Warhol. He was a uh, he was a celebrity whore, and he was he was cheap. Uh, he was cheap. cheap yeah. <laughs> I was I didn't know like this interview was one of the best interviews I ever listened yeah. to. I laughed. I got emotional. I was proud. It was so interesting. Mm. But yeah, his his inside stories about Andy Warhol was quite. The other thing that's interesting is he was a diplomat, mm. yes. right? Like, uh, I mean, I guess it's partly as a product of his family, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. he's like in his twenties and DC. He's a diplomat. I mean, yeah. you know, it's he's crazy. lived a, such an interesting life. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Groovy Shia, you want to say something? There is a sad side of this interview, and uh, like a, a lot of interviews that we've done, uh, if revolution wouldn't mm -hmm. happen, oh, yeah. Iran would be a very yeah. oh, cool place yeah. for, you know, artists, musicians, hipsters, yeah. all the... We would have been a first world country. You yeah. know what we should do is, I, I wonder if anybody's done it, we should do a thought experiment, we should do a series on what Iran would be if the oh, revolution yeah. hadn't happened, right? Yeah, I had this if idea you, for a movie. You draw the line from, you know, 1970. Six or you okay, Shia? <laughs> Shia <laughs> fell almost fell, fell out of his chair. chair. <laughs> Thank you. <about laughs> the revolution not happening. <laughs> uh, you know, if we if we uh, yeah draw a line from around seventy six seventy seven, you know, uh, and just go okay, what where does that lead to? Yeah. Two or three decades, hence, right? Uh, well, it was the cool place to. It was like a you know this cool place to visit. I mean, mm -hmm. I mentioned the Fair Fawcett thing. Mm. Um, I remember, I remember that. I remember, I don't know if I remember it because I was pretty little, but or if I remember people talking about it afterwards. Mm. But I remember it was such a big deal that Farrah Fawcett and the, the $6 million man, uh, Lee Majors, had gone to Iran in like 1977. Yeah. You know, they were they were huge movie stars, you know, and that, that was their big visit. And yeah. Well, it was a cool enough place that uh, Elizabeth Taylor dated an Iran and wanted to date an Iranian mm -hmm. diplomat, so. And right in Washington, uh, still Iranian. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Post revolution, she didn't want to have it. Post revolution, she gets the guy to become her personal photographer. Yeah. So she's still, you know, yeah. she's still she's still enamored with but Iran. But I, I feel men. for him not wanting to go back because it'll almost taint his memory of Iran. I I kind of feel the same way. Like I feel like I just want to keep it as a, you know, treasured country. I don't want to see the reality of the country mm. i don't know I, I don't think i even can <laughs> to be quite honest right. so <laughs> it was but, nice uh, that uh Fita yeah. said you wanted to do this because uh yeah of our Iranian, Iranian background that's right and um yeah <laughs> do you think uh, if uh, in those parties in iranian embassy back then at the end, they play some shisho hashtag. What? Elizabeth, they are retreating. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth June. Yeah. Eliva, yeah. Ah, yeah. That's why she didn't like being there. She's like, get me out of here, please. <laughs> um, it's, it's been a great night. Um, there's. A man, I think his name is Reza, <laughs> who's been um, following me around and asking me to do a dance with him. I really... <laughs> I turned to a stalker, too. <laughs> I, a, sh- a, sh- <laughs> a shout out to Arash and Anita Fazilipur again for this program. Uh, founders of MyTerms.ca, a successful mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They believe in educating their clients to understand every aspect of the financing being obtained each week. They see each transaction through from the beginning to the end to make sure they're closed with ease. If you're looking for a mortgage in Toronto or uh, the greater Ontario region, go to MyTerms.ca. They're among the best. Both Arash and Anita make it a priority to give back to the Persian community. Big thanks to them and MyTerms.ca. All right. In the coming days on Rook, we have Behzad Bulur, we have Tara Tiba, and we have a couple of uh, of the world's best percussionists who happen to be Iranian women. Yeah. We will get to them on a special episode next week. In the meantime, Captain Reza, the fabulous Keon, Groovy Shaya, have a good weekend. It's full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook and to become a patron of this show, go to rookmedia.com. That's our website, rookmedia.com. Actually, Ponta the Artist has just redone a lot of this website. It looks amazing. Check it out, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who do put this show together each week. Ponta the Artist. The Fabulous Keon, Super Patty Saw, Producer Susan, Thoughtful Nagin, Savvy Roham, Captain Reza Groovy Shaya, Aray Merdad, and Sponsorship Sean. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already on any of our platforms. It is free to subscribe. Find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi. Mizun Lashi.